Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this uh, webinar here today from hosted by the University of Melbourne. Um, we are here today to talk about whether you should or can trust algorithms, and if so, how and why. Uh, my name is Associate Professor Tim Miller. I'm Associate Professor of Computer Science here at the University of Melbourne, and I'm also one of the co-directors for the Centre uh, of AI and Digital Ethics, which is a cross-disciplinary research centre that started at the University of Melbourne this year to discuss uh, topics such as this. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to do acknowledgement of country uh, and acknowledge that the, the land that the University of Melbourne um, sits on is the land of the Rwandari people. Um, they're the people who lived in and around the, the Yarra River, known as the Birarung in, in their local language, which is the Wararong. And they uh, occupied the lands around this area in the river, sort of as far east as Healesville and as far north as places like Mount Macedon uh, and, and Woodend. And at the University of Melbourne, we just like to acknowledge that this is their land we're on uh, and pay respect to their elders past and present. And, and personally, I also like to acknowledge that where I'm standing right now in Essendon, this is where I live. And I'd like to thank those people for sharing their uh, wisdom and knowledge about our beautiful, unique country and how to take care of it. Um, so we're here today to discuss whether organizations are doing good things with algorithms and in particular addressing issues around trust in algorithms uh, and trust in the organizations who produce these systems and how organizations can respond to some of these issues. Um, so support, support us in this discussion. We have some uh, academics from the University of Melbourne and some industry um, partners who are, uh, who are really knowledgeable about this area. And they're gonna be answering some questions today for us and having a, hopefully a very robust discussion. So to introduce the panel, I'll just go through uh, the panel here and I'll get them to turn their video on as I introduce them. Uh, first is Professor Jeannie Patterson. Jeannie is a professor of law and she's my co-director of the Center for AI and Digital Ethics and a close colleague of mine. So uh, welcome Jeannie. Uh, Sulette Dreyfus, uh, Dr. Sulette Dreyfus is a lecturer in the School of Computing and Information Systems uh, with me um, here. And she is uh, a former journalist um, is, is um, become an academic who has a lot of interest in privacy and security. Uh, James Bailey, Professor James Bailey is a professor of computer science and artificial intelligence here in the University of Melbourne, also in the same school as me, and is a program lead for artificial intelligence. Welcome, James. Moving on to our industry partners, um, Vanessa Taholka is uh, the Digital Transformation and Skills Lead at PwC Australia and also host of Byte into IT on Triple R, who've hosted me once or twice in the last couple of years. Welcome, Vanessa. Uh, Kate Devitt, Dr. Kate Devitt is the Chief Scientist at the uh, Trusted Autonomous Systems Defense Cooperative Research Center here. And Kate's got her VR one, so all the videos move around every time we introduce someone. And uh, finally, we've got uh, Anthony Ugoni, who's the Chief Data Officer um, at Bupa, who's also been a attended on some of our panels in the past. So welcome everybody to this panel today. Uh, and as well as the panel here, I'm also going to introduce Zara Zainal. And Zara is the, the, the artist who's going to be completing this graphic recording that you can see in one of your windows um, here, where she's done some lovely images, flattering images of us, I must say, here. Uh, and she'll be spotlighted throughout the event as she's being spotlighted um, right now. So um, before we, uh, just again, before we get started, I just want to talk about, we have some pre-submitted questions from people who've registered and um, we're going to get through some of them. We've selected some of them that have been occurring themes throughout the things and we're going to address some of them and some of the questions I'll be asking the panel. Uh, but also if you're, if you're interested, to, you can type your questions into the Q&A function and we'll, we'll endeavour to respond to, them, uh, to as many of them as possible in the, the second half of this session. But depending on the, the load of questions, we won't be able, might not be able to respond to them all. Uh, and you can respond to these, you can submit these questions anonymously. Um, so now we'll, we'll move on to the, the interesting part, I guess, of the, the fun part of the, the panel here, where we're going to sort of, I've got some questions that I've prepared for the, the panel that I want to get their input on. Uh, and so I really want to start with, uh, with Kate, Kate Devitt. So Kate, you're the, you're a philosopher here. And this is the thing about this is all about trust and how we can trust algorithms. But what, what does it even mean to trust anything, let alone an algorithm? And what does it mean specifically to trust an algorithm? 
Thanks, Tim. Yeah, I just wanted to provide a little bit of um, conceptual scaffolding, just really briefly in, a, in about a minute um, that people might use if they feel like it's helpful and there may be things missing. So I'm not trying to say I've got a full uh, explanation on hand, but I think it's really important for everyone to understand that trust is about being in a relationship, either human to human or human to machine, or even machine to machine can have uh, trust. That relationship can be described potentially as something like a contract. As I know, Tim, you've written a paper with uh, co-authors recently considering trust around a contractual model. Um, that could be an implicit or an explicit contract. That can be something we sort of fall into, or maybe we've signed off on our privacy without really realising just what kind of contract we've ended up in. That happens a lot in the digital age. So those contracts can be a bit slippery. Maybe the contract it's, process itself is not very trustworthy. Um, but something about trust leaves us with expectations or something that we can predict about the behaviour or intention of another thing. Um, and that means that we think uh, it's sort of reliable perhaps or competent or has a high integrity or good motivations or character. There's a few different parameters that um, affect the way we have expectations uh, and whether we understand or we can explain uh, an algorithm or a person helps us with our predictions and also whether we feel trusting, we trust what, what that entity is like. So sometimes we don't know really how somebody works, you know, what makes us tick, but we trust them because they seem to do things that give us a sense of their integrity. So we, we believe in them. Um, I think it's important to consider, particularly with algorithms, the difference between using an algorithm and not using it. So basic conceptual differentiation here is if you use an algorithm, um, it may be because you trust it, but it also may be a risk managed use of the algorithm, which is to say, I don't really trust Google, but I'm going to do a risk managed approach where I'm actually going to use their tools because for my career, my life, I see a greater risk in not using those Google tools than using them. So it doesn't mean I trust Google, but it means that I've got a risk managed approach of using those algorithms. Um, and there's also coercive use. So maybe I use something, but it's because I don't feel like I have a a reasonable choice about it. And I think that the risks are high, but I don't feel like I have a choice. I'll use the example of the COVID safe um, app and experience I had during lockdown, where I went to a restaurant and there was a, a sign up sheet for personal information. And you could see everybody's details who had been to the restaurant, which I thought was a big disclosure of personal information sort of upfront. And it said, um, if you're using the COVID Safe Act, tick this box and you don't have to fill out the information. But I felt like if I filled out the information, I'd be exposing myself, but I didn't want to necessarily download the app either. So I found myself between a rock and a hard place. I didn't, but I felt coerced into providing my information to that restaurant that was displayed for everyone to see. Um, so that's if you use algorithms, it can be those three, trusted, risk managed or coerced. Also, if you don't use an algorithm, it uh, might be that you don't trust it, but it also might be that you just don't need it or it's not wanted. So that's enough from me, Tim, and I'm really excited to hear what everyone else has to say. That's really great. Yes, and I love this, this idea of trust as a relationship, as you know about what I've written about. And, and so, I mean, just to follow up, do, are, we, do we, do you, are you saying we're in, we're in a relationship with an algorithm? Would you say that? I mean, not, not in a personal relationship, but would you say that's the relationship? Is, is, is the I think word? we are all in relationships with our technologies, yes, uh, of differing kinds of relationship. Good, great. So um, I guess um, now I'll, I'll ask Sulet um, here. Sulet, I mean, we talk about trust in algorithms. Uh, we, we've been using algorithms on a large scale since the 19, 1980s, I guess, here. What, why is this? Why is this relevant now? Why is we're, we're, we're a university and, and, and uh, you know sort of leading edge uh, industrial partners talking about trust all of a sudden? Why is this such a problem now? I think it's because AI and machine learning have amplified the ability to act at speed and at scale. So in a sense, the, the computers and the algorithms we used to use were something where you might be doing the work of five people to get from point A to point C. Now you can do the work of 50 or 100 people to get from point A to point Z. Um, and that changes the power relationship, the power dynamics. So I think people fear AI and machine learning because they think it's about a shift in power from the human to the machine. There's a little bit of that, but actually it's also causing a shift in power between the individual human and the organization. And that becomes very important because you have to think about how will we make the organization accountable? What transparency requirements are there? Um, you know, and, and what does that mean for the, the workers of the future? So if you particularly think, for example, about cybersecurity software, 
increasingly that's been semi-automated or automated using machine learning. Now, in the past, you might have had more human in the loop processes. Um, uh, it, you know, what is what vendors say is available today with cybersecurity software is if I take your computer and I open it up and I start typing on it, they claim that within a few minutes, the computer will shut down because it knows through the behavioral analytics that you and I are not the same person. We type at different speeds, we make different spelling errors, we use different programs at different times of the day. However, um, the question is, is that when sometimes those algorithms don't do what we expect or don't necessarily treat people justly, there has to be some recourse to actually fix that. And in the past, you might have been able to pick up the phone and call someone in the organization, ask that to be fixed. Now that's much harder, um, particularly if the decisions are a long way away. So maybe you had an IT department locally, now that decision is actually being made by an executive team and head office in California um, about people who live from Manila to Melbourne. Um, and, and, and that in a sense is dictating how they work. The other concern is the repurposing of the information. So the idea that that information was taken initially to stop hackers from invading your computer Computer, that can be obviously a very good thing, a very strong thing. But if the information was repurposed, for example, to say, oh, we, the organization, don't feel that this worker is doing enough hours, or they're spending too much time on the tasks that they like doing at work and not enough on the things that they don't like. All of a sudden, that information that was gathered for the purposes of computer security are now being used for other things like managing the workforce. So I think those are really important questions that are all raised. Um, by this transition that's going on. Doesn't mean the transition is necessarily a bad one, just means we need to have our eyes open and think about checks and balances to make it work properly and justly. So that, so that's, I like this thing about the sort of power dynamic that you talk about here. And I mean, I mean, Jeannie, I, I, wanna, I wanna ask you this because you're a consumer protection lawyer. Um, is that what's driving some of the new research in consumer protection, this idea of power imbalance? I mean, what, what do you see the problems as, uh, as being? I mean, so, so let's some of a tech, somewhat of a technologist, but if you're a lawyer, what do you think these problems are? Um, well, I was interested, Jim, to hear this conversation, particularly from Kate, but also Suleyn, about um, contracts and relationships as relevant to trust, but asymmetrical relationships where one person has all the power and one doesn't. Now, in contract law, we talk about um, relational contracts, in fact, and most contracts that consumers have with the suppliers of goods and services, and indeed the government, are what we call relational contracts. They're built on a whole lot of understandings and conventions that mean that the parties have um, confidence in their ability to work together and for consumers reasonable expectations about both companies and governments to be fulfilled. And what's happening now is more and more our relationship is mediated by algorithms. That can be useful because it can lead to efficiency gains but the difficulty is consumers quite frankly don't always know this is happening and therefore there's little transparency around what Suleta and I have been looking in, what consumers don't see, what information is not being made available to them, and also the avenues for contesting the decisions that are made about them. So in this relationship between consumers and suppliers, there's an increasing lack of transparency and increasing lack of contestability. Yes, very, very insightful. That's so I think we're all, we're all coming around this idea of relationships and, and contracts. And when you have this relationship with a power imbalance, it, it creates some sort of, can, can create trust issues. Um, James, you're, you're the sort of the, you're the sort of AI person, one of the two AI people on the panel here. And I guess I want to ask you, we're talking about, can we trust algorithms? I mean, it's, there's just two tides to trust, right? There's, there's being trustworthy in the first place. And then a, a, I guess, choosing to trust it, if you want to put it like that. Uh, are algorithms even trustworthy in the first place? I mean, what types of decisions do, should we be able to delegate and trust to algorithms and um, in this case anyway? Uh, th thanks, Tim. Um, I, I guess at one level, uh, algorithms are, are completely trustworthy. They'll, tell exa they'll do exactly what you program them to do. So problem solved. But, but I think we're, we're probably talking about you know, something a little, a little bit different. In a, in a general sense, um, algorithms are all around us. You know, we've got algorithms flying out, flying our planes for us. We've got algorithms running our Zoom call for us. We've got algorithms in our phone. We, we trust them. They're, they're, they're doing they're doing mostly a, a great job for us. 
But um, Sulet um, has mentioned AI and machine learning, and 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 I think that's where some of these these trustworthy trust issues are, are coming up. The idea is that machine learning technology, it's it's the idea is it's you've got algorithms that are learning learning from experience. So it's basically using the past to to predict the future, and you give the machine a lot of examples of the past and you, you ask it to, to, to make a prediction about the future. These big problems occur when the future isn't the same as the past or there's some, there's some, sort, of, there's some sort of shift in, 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 in the environment or you've got people who are trying to make, make the algorithms fail, hostile, hostile parties. So there's, there's issues with the, the predictability of, of, of AI and machine learning algorithms. Um, the simple ones, often you can, you can um, be able to judge what's going to happen, but some of these more complex algorithms, areas you might have heard of like, like deep learning, neural networks, um, they can be extremely complex, extremely difficult to explain. And if you make a very, very small change, they can, they can make um, completely different, different sorts of decisions. Um, so different types of algorithms, um, machine learning versus standard algorithms, different, di different sorts of issues. Um, I hope I've answered some of your question. You'll have to remind me which bits I've uh, left out. It did. It, it did. So, I mean, I, you, you think that we do need this level of scrutiny that we're talking about now? Um, I, I think we need it in, in, in some cases, uh, definitely. I, I think the sorts of, the sorts of areas where you, you've got higher trust uh, these these scenarios we've got a sort of a well-defined fairly fairly narrow sort of problem um, you've got fairly clear performance criteria about about what you want what you want the algorithm to do um, um, in these sorts of scenarios um, you know, maybe where there's low low consequences um, you, you, you you're likely to have a, a higher level of trust but if you've got um, scenarios where um, a bit more unpredictable conditions. Conditions could could could, could change. Um, potential for for, for um, bias and an effect on on minority groups. These other sorts of situations, um, you're going to want to apply a lot more a lot more scrutiny. I think we're only learning how to how to do that. We're we're, we're certainly not not there yet in terms of robust certification of of, of how to um, how to validate and verify um, our machine learning algorithms. Right. So I was kind of hoping for a, a bit more uh, <laughs> adversarial discussion here, but I think we're all kind of on the same page here that, uh, yeah, we, maybe we can trust these things for small decisions, but there's a lot around the trust about the organization is, um, is probably key here. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll come over, to, I'll come to you, Anthony, right? I mean, you're, you're a chief data officer, you're at Vupa. Should we trust you and your organization? That's a great question. That's a great question, Tim. Um, let me take it a step back. Um, going back to something that James said, um, we can we can absolutely trust the algorithms to do exactly what we've asked them to do. Uh, whenever I stand on the corner of um, Flinders and Swanson Street and the green man goes off, uh, I don't trust the ecosystem around me to every everybody there be obeying the rules. And even though I've got the right to walk across the road and the algorithm is correct, I still look left and right before I actually walk across the road. So um, the algorithm is doing exactly what we want it to do. The question is, is the ecosystem around us uh, set up to do the right thing by the algorithm? Um, so I've got some, some notes. We should always question, um, we give, we give organisations the right to our data. As, as we sign up, um, you should only ever work with organisations that you trust, there's a start. Then the question is, do they hit all the legal hurdles? If they have a license to operate, then they probably have. Um, and so the first question you should ask yourself, when I interact with an organization, given that I've given up all this information, uh, are they creating value for me? Are they creating appropriate value for me? Or are they simply focused on value for themselves? Uh, the answer should always be, they're creating value for me. The second piece is, do I feel like the use of that data to create value for me uh, is appropriate. Um, and do I have options? Do I have options to opt out? Or do I have options um, to opt in even further? So those questions should always be in the back of your mind. So um, for the people listening, my advice would be always question um, every interaction that you have with any organization, be it um, uh, private, commercial, 
um, government, you should always question why has this organisation chosen to have this interaction with me? So I feel like it's appropriate. Um, and I, something that I'm, I'm seeing a little bit more in the generation that's coming in behind us, this um, quiet acceptance of throwing out the digital exhaust and this quiet acceptance um, as a community of the use of algorithms to interact with me. Um, they, our children are far more comfortable and what I'd like to see uh, are more consumer advocates and public debate uh, around some of the things that organisations are doing. Um, and then we'll find a, a happy balance. Typically what, what needs to happen is we need to swing hard in one direction and then come some way back to find that balance between um, what is appropriate, trustworthy, et cetera. Great, great response. And so, I mean, I'm going to basically, I'll, I'll move to you, Kate, uh, and I want to hear your thoughts because you're, you're in quite a different area, right? I mean, to, to what Anthony's asking here, you work in this sort of defense and there's a lot less around personal data and all this kind of stuff, but sh should we trust your organizations and defense organizations as well, given what, what they're doing with um, algorithms? I mean, I think the Australian public needs to be questioning every aspect of the society they live in right now. I don't think there's any organization, government or private um, that isn't facing challenges to the way that business is done and it is the citizen's right to inquire about how any organisation is operating. So in terms of what is defence doing, I think it is um, important for the Australians, for Australians to understand what the Australian constitution is and what the obligations are um, to the Australian citizenry in the Defence Act. So the more people who read the Australian constitution, the better. Um, the military in Australia has obligations to the civilian populace. Um, they are very rule bound in Australia. There are certainly situations in other countries that perhaps there are less rules and regulations. So um, I encourage Australians to understand uh, how rule governed defence is. Um, there is a huge range of controls over any use of algorithms used inside defence under a couple of different le legal protocols. So the um, Article 36 review process uh, is a, in, uh, an agreement that Australia has made, a commitment that any new weapon or technology developed in Australia, uh, will, it will be ensured that it will be in abidance with international humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict. So there is no particular ban on any specific technology or algorithm for the Australian uh, military at this stage, but the abidance with the Article 36 review process puts Australia in a very small minority of nations that are committed to that abidance. So that means making sure there are not um, unintended, unintended harms, that uh, any use of force is proportionate and dis appropriately discriminatory. International humanitarian law requires that there is human um, decision-making, human cognitive decision making over choices around proportionality of use of force. So it isn't up to the machines, it's up to the human command to use any piece of technology in a conflict or in fact in the defence of, of Australians in any form of situation. So as part of the, um, the COVID task force for the ADF, a lot of people don't realise that the ADF cannot do things domestically in Australia legally unless they're invited to do so by the state. It's not the federal government's responsibility. Each state has an MOU with the ADF if they want them to participate. So obviously COVID has been a big year, bushfires have been a big year. Um, every single action by defence is highly rule governed. And there's an extensive set of obligations that defence has to also trace all of their decision making. And it's interesting to me watching the AI ethics debate emerge because one of the big things that is being demanded and reasonably so is explainability, auditability of decision making by AI, AI algorithms and in defence as part of our legislative obligations, the humans inside defence have to keep track of their decision making, have to keep paper trails of what happened, why things happened, who made a decision. In the Victorian government, we can see that there's a lot of contention about who authorised the use of security forces with the, um, the motels, right? And it was a big um, investigation to try to look at the paper trail and say, well, who was in the room when that decision was made? And so government in Australia of, of all levels are expected to maintain very um, strong decision trails. And I think that is a good thing for legislation. And it means that is followed through into any human machine team. So if you've got any form of algorithm that is part of decision-making for Australians, 
that machine has to be in abidance with the legislative requirements. And some of those legal frameworks involve the requirement that human commanders make the decisions in terms of they are the ones responsible for the outcomes of any use of an algorithm. Yes, very good. And, and I guess you could say, unlike the, the, the decision in Victoria, we probably couldn't say the algorithm evolved to the decision as it went along and there was no single point of decision that was made. It won't, it won't work like that. Um, slightly less of a box, I'd say. Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Vanessa, we haven't spoken to you yet, so I'm going to come over to you now. Uh, and, and so when, when we talk about trust and algorithms, so far the focus has really been on, oh, consumers this, consumers that. But really, organisations are the ones who deploy it. They need to have, have trust in it. And so what are some of the challenges that you see organisations um, that steer organisations away from using things like artificial intelligence solutions in, in applications? Are the, what, what are the kind of issues they're having? Well, there are real um, challenges as AI is disrupting the entire value change for a lot of businesses. And the C-suites are increasingly focused on understanding potential impact of making changes with AI within organisations, not just in consumer facing ways. Uh, so there was a recent survey by Source Global who spoke to 301 senior execs across nine different regions in the world. And 84% thought that AI based decisions needed to be explainable in order to be trusted. Uh, a further 52% want to understand their AI systems and tackle the black box problem. And then there's issues around cybersecurity and um, managing transformational change in their businesses. But I thought it was really um, comforting to know that we're hearing the same sort of concerns around transparency and trust within organisations. And I think we have to understand this with the sense that the people working for these organisations are just like you and I. I'm working for a very large organisation, PwC, but I'm also um, a board member of a public advocacy group, Digital Rights Watch. And I think a lot of my colleagues you find have these cross interests in the, the public private lives of how these things are going to affect us. So some of the questions that we're asking ourselves as we, as we change in this space, are how do I test for bias in the data, in the models, in human use of AI algorithms to improve fairness of treatment across our organizations? We're asking what can we do to add transparency, explainability and provability to the modeling process to then improve our understanding of any outputs that we're getting from those changes. We're also asking about security and robustness of AI through rigorous validation, continuous monitoring, maintenance, verification and adversarial modeling. These are some of the techniques at play. Um, we're asking, what do I need to do to understand the systemic and moral implications of the use of AI? And that's increasingly being tied to our conversations around the importance of diversity and inclusion, and not just speaking about those, but also actively building teams around those principles. We're looking at how we can design effective AI operating models and processes to improve accountability and quality. Because if there's one thing we know about working for clients is that it's not enough to deliver work, we've got to deliver all of the reasoning and the, the quality assurance with that work as well. And then, um, as James mentioned, so importantly, what problems will I trust algorithms to help solve? And because so many organisations are learning in this space, it is a very piecemeal process. Um, lots of the examples we hear in the media tend to be large scale things gone wrong, you know, people identifying photographs and making recommendations to whether someone should get bail or not in the States is a really famous example. Um, I don't see those sort of large scale um, programs being enacted day to day. I'm seeing very small incremental attempts to improve organisational processes around submitting leave. You know, I'm seeing real, real bite sized pieces. I'm not saying that that won't happen, but I do think that organisations are being very cautious about how they take on these approaches. Right, so it's, it's in, basically you're saying that that's the same, we're having the same kinds of concerns in organisations. Uh, pro probably they're, they're a little bit more focused than the consumer ones because they're part of that chain, but we're seeing the same kind of concerns. I mean, Anthony, do you see the same, you, you, do you have similar views here that this is what I guess uh, are keeping organisations or uh, making them hesitant to adopt these technologies? Uh, I agree entirely. The uh, organisations are becoming far more aware of the uh, the information that they hold on. Uh, you mentioned before, Tim, we've been doing this since about the 80s or thereabouts. 
uh, and by and large, it's been really hard to get our hands on data. It's been really hard to crunch the data. Um, and then even with an algorithm in hand, it's been very hard to use the algorithm. Uh, and so for the most part in corporate uh, organizations, it's mostly been about cross-sell type opportunities. Um, so very, very low danger of, um, of getting it wrong in, in the most part. Um, organizations are very aware today that uh, they are collecting data at enormous scale um, with uh, very low latency periods. Uh, and the, the questions that they could ask uh, are far more reaching than simply, you know, you bought product A, maybe I should offer you product B. Uh, and so organisations are taking uh, a more cautious approach. The, the view that I get to see, uh, Vanessa um, probably get to see quite a bit more than me. Um, so taking, taking uh, a very cautious view and internally um, putting efforts into you know, what is our position on the ethical use of this data? That's, that's emerging. I'd like to see it emerge faster, uh, truth be told. Um, but, I, but I am pleased at, uh, at, uh, at what I'm seeing. And, and so, I mean, I guess, Vanessa, part of your role is, if I understand, is, is you know, sort of, um, well, you're the skills lead. So I guess you're looking a little bit about um, training and all these types of things. But, I mean, what are some of the things that organisations can do to help engender trust from, you know, their the customers, the, the data, the, the, the clients, all these kind of things, what can they do? There's a lot they can do. I think a lot of organisations already have regular training programs around compliance, whatever that might mean in their industries. But for us, that has meant bringing in um, regular training so that people don't forget because we think it's so important around data handling and what is data governance and, you know, collecting only what you need and rules around storage and de-identification and principles about, you know, getting rid of data as soon as you're not using it for that purpose anymore. And all these sort of practices, it's really worth building those up for what is that state of play in your organisation. Uh, we really think that upskilling non-AI professionals to work with AI is super important as well. And it's not just about diversity and inclusion, it is also about it's becoming a crucial part of workforce strategy. So we actually need the broad workforce to understand and have a chance to influence um, things that are happening in this way. So we're looking at citizen users, citizen developers and data sciences and other S SMEs kind of coming together to collaborate on projects. Uh, internally, you know, it's what can we do, what can organisations do around transparency, around oversight, around um, building consumer protections in, around creating responsibilities for accountability and making sure that there are pathways to solve problems, to identify problems before they um, get rolled out. Uh, so there's all those sorts of things. Um, there's approaches to testing and review, inter including interpretability and bias and robustness and security, and there's various technology standards. And I think that's what we do internally. But as a consulting firm, we're also very concerned about the sorts of advice that we're giving other organisations struggling in this space. Um, so we've got different approaches to that. We've got a whole team on cyber and digital trust. We have a framework, a responsible AI framework that helps organisations work through some of these issues. And it's not just about solving problems. It's also about addressing risks um, and, yeah, helping people find their way. And so a, a lot of then the, you, you, the sort of what PwC is doing is around is about building trust is to make sure you do the right thing. And then if you do the right thing, hopefully bad things won't happen and you won't, you won't sort of lose trust. Um, you, well, you, it's not even hopefully, it's like test yeah. and, and actively yeah. look at bad things that could happen and have a red team and a blue team and challenge yeah. your ideas and have a risk management framework. So if you're... Um, doing something that could have risky outcomes, think about what are the worst case outcomes and how do you mitigate that ever happening? Because nobody wants to be responsible for the next robo debt. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, that's right. Very good. Um, that, that was, that's very interesting. Um, so I guess in this, in this state, I want to come back to um, James Bailey. Um, what, what's the kind of state of, of academic research in all this in this range, at least from your, your viewpoint. Uh, thanks, Tim. Um, well, the good news is that there's a lot of research going on. It's an extremely active area. 
a um, lot, lot of people very, very interested, um, a lot of stuff happening. Um, I guess breaking, breaking it down, we, we, we mentioned explainability, um, lots of different methods people are, are proposing to, to, to explain AI models and, and why they predict this is a cat or, or why this is a building. Um, the challenge is that there's lots of different methods and they tend to give different answers. Um, and perhaps that's just because it's a really complex problem. We, as humans, we, we want simple explanations for, for things, but inherently some of these um, AI models are extremely, extremely complex. And we, we might not be able to find the, the simple explanations that we're, that we're actually seeking. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of work on, on the robustness, um, robustness issues. So you want your, you, you, you want your AI model to be very robust in the sense that if you, if, if you change the inputs or if you corrupt the inputs, you, you, you scramble pixels in the image or, or whatever, that it, it still gives a, a sensible answer. And so a lot of different methods for, for, for increasing robustness in, in, in that type of sense. Um, the bias we've mentioned, um, a lot of people looking at bias, but the challenge is that there's probably dozens of definitions of bias. Which, which one do you want? This one or, or that one or, or, or another one or a new one we haven't, we haven't thought of yet. So that's, that's going to be, that, that's going to be a challenge. Um, people have, people have um, also identified really surprising behavior of some of these um, AI models that if you, if you make a very small, small change to, to, to an input, like an image that you give it, it can give a completely different answer and it can often give a, a really strange answer. And, and these are called adversarial examples. And it's a very hot area. Um, a lot of people are trying to work out why it happens, what to do about it. Um, it's again, related to the, the, the robustness issue. I think, I think overall, what, what I would say is that at the moment, we, we want everything. We, we, want a, we want an AI that's really accurate. We want an AI that's really explainable. We want an AI that's really robust. We want an AI that's free of bias. Sure, we can probably define all of these things, but I don't think we're going to get them all. At the, at the end of the day, we're going to have to make some, some trade-offs. We could maybe make it a bit more robust, but it, it will be a bit less accurate. Are we, are we really comfortable with, with that sort of trade-off? And I, 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 I have the sense that maybe we don't, we, had, we don't have enough experience with some of these trade-offs to, to, to really know what, uh, what we want. Are we trying to make it accurate for the, for, for, the bet, for the average case or are we trying to make it accurate for the worst case? Um, they're, they're completely different things mathematically. Um, speaking of mathematics, uh, the, the other thing I'd say is there's some really interesting work on, on certification. So can you, can you actually prove that your AI, AI is going to behave in a, in a certain way? And by prove, I mean write out a mathematical proof that, that, you know, given this, this type of input, it will, it will do this and it won't, it won't do that. Um, I think that's a really interesting direction. If, if, if it can be achieved, perhaps we can, you know, characterize the competence of, of some of these AI models and get a bit more confidence through, through that type of route. Um, the last thing I'd say is that, you know, we're not going to get it right up front. We, we need the ability to, to, to modify what, what, whatever we get. So, just like you know, when I buy a copy of Windows, I have to keep updating it because it, it, it just, it's got bugs in it. It's, it's got security patches. It just doesn't work. Um, um, it's not gonna stay the same. It may well be the same with, with, with AI. We might have to be tolerant to, to being able to update it and upgrade it and, and change it over, over time. We would hope so, I guess, is the, <laughs> the response to that. You do want it to improve over time. And I mean, I'm, I'm gonna sort of, Jeannie, I'll ask you, I mean, a similar question because James gave the kind of the, the computer science view about what's going on, but you know, you're, you're the co-director of a, a center around digital ethics, which talk, which has a lot of trust issues. I mean, what's going on in, in other fields that you're aware of, not just at Melbourne, but elsewhere? Um, well, I'm gonna actually step back, a, step back a little bit and talk about this idea of creating trust and earning trust. A lot of the discussion when we're talking about interfaces between um, AI, and I'll talk about citizens, not so much corporations, citizens, consumers, is premised, um, the discussions tend to be premised on upskilling consumers and citizens so they can understand AI. Um, and I'd have to say that the problem with that is it's called responsabilizing individuals, which pretty much 
does nothing because as a number of the people have pointed out in the chat, I don't have a choice whether I engage with Google. I don't have a choice whether I bank. I don't have a choice to whether I buy insurance. I don't have a choice whether I go to a doctor or a lawyer. I don't have a choice about education. Now, all of these fields are increasingly being um, relying on different types of algorithms of various sophistication to make decisions. So the idea that we empower consumers or citizens to make better choices about their interactions with technology, quite frankly, um, is ludicrous. It doesn't work. So what I've liked about the discussion so far is we've been hearing discussions about structures and processes that embed responsibility and trust in corporations which are the entities that are deploying algorithms or in the case, case of Kate's um, comments in the government. And we come back to the idea of the constitution and legal frameworks for how entities that hold considerable power and in their interactions with, with citizens um, behave and the responsibilities that are attached to them in their use of algor algorithms and other um, automated processes. So I think what's really important is when we're thinking about how we at universities research or educate about AI, we shouldn't just be thinking about just the technical aspects of it, although obviously those are critically important, but we also need to be thinking about a scepticism, which is Anthony's point, and also the, the skills that are needed to build governance frameworks, quite frankly, around the use of these technologies so that citizens and individuals um, can be confident that their interests are substantively protected rather than them having to check out everything they, they choose to use in a situation where they can't really choose to participate at all. Um, and so what do you think, I mean, how, how, how is Melbourne University responding to this challenge from a, like say an educational viewpoint? It's a really good challenge and I think that it uh, from you I mean it's the role of universities to educate and respond to the big challenges quite frankly so it you know forums like this are important but um, as you know Tim because you're part of the project so it's a nice question and um, we at Melbourne Uni are developing a number of subjects that our students from different disciplines to engage with new technologies including AI and algorithmic processes, but from a variety of perspectives. So we've just finished teaching an undergraduate subject, which is called AI Ethics and the Law, which is asked, gives students a number of case studies about the way technology has been rolled out in society, looking at everything from med tech, legal tech to environmental protection through technology and asking students to start to unpack their responses to that technology. So some of those technologies offer tremendous advantages and promise um, to society. And let's, I think it's really important we don't forget that if we're concerned about the environment, probably technology can be really helpful to us there. But there's also hidden costs as well. Um, and what we've really asked students in, in that subject is to not is not merely respond intuitively to these technologies, but respond robustly um, with a willingness to try and engage with both the technological aspects of these developments, but also the ethical and the regulatory um, aspects to the challenge that is a face so that they've got a robust and rigorous basis for responding, which allows them to participate in this conversation that Vanessa and Anthony and Kate and James have spoken about engaging in a conversation about good design and good governance. Uh, great. And so um, I'll remind the audience here again uh, of Zara, our graphic recorder, who's busily drawing these types of things in. And I've been on a few panels with Zara has worked on and I'm always flabbergasted that she can draw this and pay attention to what's going on at the same time because I, I can only do one of them, that's for sure. Um, okay, so I mean, I, I, I wanna ask just sort of, I guess one last question before I we take some, we're getting some questions uh, sent through here and I'm gonna address this to Sulet. So Sulet, you, you are a journalist and I guess part of the journalist's job is to um, question how people are doing things. Do you think that what we're doing kind of organizationally and from research and education, is, is this the right way? Is this enough? Or is there something that, we, that we're missing? Who should be the guardian that makes these decisions? So I think it's a start, um, but it's in that category of necessary, but not yet sufficient. Um, and I think what we've seen from journalism in a, you know, in a parallel way to this is that transparency is not enough. So we are drowning in information. Do we have the capacity to process all that information? No. 
Therefore, we need other mechanisms to protect us. Those are things like protection of digital rights as other human rights, the way we protect human rights. So you can say, oh, well, take or leave this product. It's shrink wrapped, it's consent, it's forced consent. Who cares? You don't get to use the product without it. But that's a little like saying, and hey, people should be allowed to sell their kidneys on eBay. No, there are just some things we say that are a bad idea. And, and so I think those things have to be considered. You know, we had a question from the audience um, from Toby Walsh about whether there were some decisions we should never give to machines. Maybe not, maybe they could all be given to machines, but there are certainly some decisions where you have to have a human in the loop as a fail safe mechanism. So a decision to unplug someone from life support in hospital as an example. Maybe you can have a system that can learn, um, that can give an intelligent recommendation, but you really wanna have a human in that decision-making loop. At the end of the day, you need to have um, governance, oversight, accountability, you know, as Vanessa raised, those things can't be ignored. You can't just fly forth on a wing and a prayer and hope that, that it's enough. They have to be designed with real power at the coal face to people who work at the coal face, to individuals in society. They can't be made by accident. Um, they have to be by design because otherwise you end up with robo debt as was raised. And what happens when you get that? There's a case of some unintended consequence, but some intended consequence and very little accountability about either uh, and a lot of angry response from the public and, uh, and a parliamentary inquiry into it as a result. So key element I think ultimately will be about um, recourse to justice in an AI world. Do you have, and that's where human in the loop comes in, do you have a recourse to justice when things go wrong? We can draw from existing areas of law, of policy. So those are things like the GDPR and other protections that exist for EU, European uh, citizens. Can we have those too? Those are things like whistleblower protection schemes uh, at law and in regulation that have been around for 20 or 30 years. If we draw from these other parallel disciplines, we can apply them in AI and machine learning, and they will hopefully be proven ways to actually protect us in the future as we go forward. Great, that's a great positive uh, note to, for, to finish my questions on. So um, thanks, people have been sending questions in. Uh, we've got about 300 people on this today, so and, and well over 50 questions now, so we definitely won't get to all of them. But uh, uh, my esteemed colleague, Shanton, is in the background trying to collate sort of questions that are similar and, and feed them through to us. So we've got a few that we've got from pre-submitted questions and, and other ones, and I'm going to try and direct them to, to certain uh, people um, here. And so... Um, there was an interesting question that was pre-submitted and I want to ask this one to Vanessa and to James because I want to get the, the the industry and the academic perspective. So Vanessa, do you do you see kind of investors and companies that are they're falling for what's called AI branding stories that are maybe falling for, uh, that are expecting too much and falling for the AI branding stories? Look, it's not something I see in my day job, but in my um, enthusiastic covering of technology for Triple R. Uh, I certainly get a whole lot of startups uh, sharing information with us. And you do see with every wave of technology, there are people who are investing in, in the next cool thing. Uh, and there are some pretty poorly designed solutions to problems out there with AI stuck on them at the moment. So I think that's inevitable in this field, but uh, you know, it is one space where hopefully the market will out and uh, they just they just fall away and they vanish and you wonder what happened to that terrible idea. <laughs> yes, that's right. Very good. And I mean, James, what do you see from the academic perspective? Uh, well, everyone everyone's talking about AI, Tim. Um, and in the one sense, yeah, that's that's, that's great. Um, uh, um, the, the, there's a huge amount of interest. Um, I, I, I think the uh, the risk is that uh, everything is getting called. AI, or well, a lot of things are getting called AI, and, and the term is it's sort of hard to know what it means, um, um, given given the ways it's being being used. So you know, just just standard software that, um, that, that probably doesn't have any AI functionality is often being referred to as AI. Um, so I guess the answer to your question is yes. To to to, to some extent, maybe people are getting carried away, but. On the flip side, I, I think some of this technology is in, in incredibly powerful, and you know we're, we're able to do things now that we, we just couldn't ten years ago in terms of 
um, the ability of AI to, to process speech, to, to, to process vision, to, to, to process te text. It's, it's really impressive from a technical point of view. Um, and so the, the next question that we got submitted, and I, I want to address this to the, the three industry people. Um, the question is, what keeps you awake at night? And I assume they mean from a professional perspective. And so I'll, I'll kind of go Kate, Vanessa, Anthony, because I don't think anyone cares what keeps an academic awake at night. But the other three of you probably have some good insight here. Kate? Yeah, okay, good question. What keeps me awake at night? And some of the people in our chat have um, pointed at some of this. So what keeps me awake at night is um, the lack of regulation of corporations um, is a huge issue. So um, the book called Like War, The Weaponization of Social Media um, is written by a couple of excellent writers. And in their book, they really articulate, uh, it's, it's not just a matter of misinformation by, between all of the social media platforms and the um, surveillance capitalism that's manipulating our behaviors. That's all pretty terrible. Um, but a lot of people don't realise that um, real harms, physical harms, have emerged from Facebook groups. So there are competing Libyan dictators who have Facebook groups, they've got supporters there, and they use social media platforms to wage war. And so Facebook is a, a has power that is beyond nation states. It's so that all of our structures that the different countries have attempted to put together in international relations, the UN, um, international legal frameworks. There's a vast amount of work that has gone on in the last hundred years to make sure that atrocities don't occur. But in the modern era of information sharing and use, the control of information is in the hands of corporations that are outside the jurisdictions of nations and uh, the mechanisms of control. So corporate power is directly responsible for war and harms in a way that the average citizen doesn't understand. So I encourage you to read Like War, The Weaponization of Social Media, and also Shoshana Zuboff's uh, Surveillance Capitalism. These two books together um, paint a picture of the modern world um, that is really quite terrifying. <laughs> so, um, so that's my main concern. I'm much more concerned, and because I'm an epistemologist, by academic training and epistemologists do get kept up at night. But when I was in graduate school, it was about barn facades, whether it's a real barn or it's a fake barn. That's what philosophers think about in their typical thought experiments. And now I'm working in defense environments. Um, the barn facade problem is much, much more scary um, as misinformation and disinformation campaigns roll through our society. And it's a very difficult for individuals, organizations, governments um, to know how to collectively manage misinformation and disinformation that enables democratic process. So it gives people the voice. That's the promise and the hope and the dream of things like social media and the internet. How do we hold on to the promise of that democratic uh, behaviors um, and not be sucked into uh, being completely polarized, uh, being in uh, information bubbles where we don't understand what other people are thinking. We don't have empathy for them. We don't have sympathy for each other. We, we really um, become the worst form of ourselves, as opposed to the sort of um, collective empathetic humans that we can be. And of course, during COVID, as we become even more socially distant from each other physically, um, our behaviors digitally have greater and greater influence over the opportunities or lack of opportunities individuals have in the world. So that's what keeps you up at night. Yikes, all right, <laughs> that's very, that was a yeah, very frightening. There's some frightening perspectives. I know the books you're talking about. Well, I've read one of them. Um, Vanessa, what's what keeps you awake at night? I uh, loved Kate's reading recommendations there. Um, I can echo that they're great. I think that until we remove bias in society, we will struggle to remove it from programs. So building in protections is super important. So anytime um, we're using algorithms to do anything in the predictive space, decision making, I'm asking how is it amplifying disadvantage given that we're not perfect people and that we have biases. So that's that's what keeps me awake at night. How do I de-bias things? And and would you say though, I mean, one of the, it's kind of one of the horror stories of, of this kind of machine learning boom is the fact that we're getting these biased decisions. But on the other hand, it's awakened us to some of the, it, 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 it awakened Amazon to the fact that their previous hiring decisions were extremely sexist um, as well. So would you say that 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 um, 
while we might not use it, it's probably given us some valuable input on the way that human beings go around making decisions. That could be one um, kind way of looking at it. I would say, though, that there is a sense of an eternal innocence where we go, oh, we had no idea that we were so biased. We had no idea that we had these problems. Like how, how many, you know, decades can we have these awakenings mm -hmm. and, um, and these gradual realisations? I think that's, um, I, I don't buy it. Mm -hmm. I, I think that we need to be better than that. And mm -hmm. if we can't be better than that by, you know, um, relying on people to all be, you know, amazing, then we need to build that into our systems. Like how, how can we make our systems better than that? Very good. Anthony, what keeps you awake, <coughs> awake at night? <clears throat> yeah, a number of things. Um, so really quickly, I love Vanessa's roundup then. I don't buy it. Um, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Um, you know, we've had enough, we've had enough bad goes at this now to, to be on the lookout and just be better at it. Um, but so the bias piece does genuinely keep me awake at night. The other, the other two things that keep me awake um, one is people typically don't understand that when we build these algorithms, we build them from what's kind of called naturally occurring data. Um, so we will have a product out in field where we're serving customers or making recommendations or whatever it might be. Um, and that will happen naturally. So Anthony will never be in a certain part of the store. So you'll never see somebody like Anthony with his profile buying these products, you'll see him in other parts of the store. Uh, and there'll be many instances of pairs of, say, consumer and product that never occur. Um, and we'll build algorithms on that data. And we can put controls in place uh, all around those algorithms. But then I will worry that sometimes we will inadvertently put that algorithm uh, into a situation uh, and ask it to make a decision in a combination of things that the data has never seen before. Uh, and it's very hard to predict what the algorithm will do uh, in that situation. So having the right controls around um, all the, all the uh, original work around debiasing and building good AI needs to be in place, but also making sure that you only apply that AI uh, in an environment that it was designed to be applied in um, is something that keeps me awake. Um, Tim, you also prompted us on the, the panelist questions, the, the human in the loop question. Um, I do worry that uh, individuals, human beings, become so reliant uh, on the AI that they, that they forget that they have uh, a lot to add to the decision making uh, around what that AI is trying to do. And it's very hard for AI to dig deep into your morals and ethics or community standards at times. Um, and so, giving people things that are so accurate that they sometimes forget to question what the AI is doing, I think is really important, depending on the cost of doing so. Uh, I think it's really important every so often just to put something a little bit random into the field, just to nudge the human being out of their slumber, just to say, I just want to make sure you're paying attention. Um, now, it's okay to do that uh, maybe with a call centre operator selling widgets. You probably don't want to do that in an autonomous vehicle going down the freeway, but how do we make sure that the humans um, uh, just kind of reset themselves and understand that they have a role to play uh, in the ecosystem and not rely entirely on that AI? That's um, that's another thing that really that really worries me. That that's that's a good one. And so I'm I'm actually going to come back to you, Kate, about this because this was a, a question sent for the Q and A. Is about it's all very good to have a human in the loop, but uh, th there is this problem of overtrust. Right, and, and part of what we need to do is have trust around, certain, you talked about contracts, certain contracts and distrust around uh, others. I mean, in, in a kind of defense space where, I mean, Anthony's talking about self-driving cars, you're working in defense space, even higher stakes potentially. What, what, what's the kind of thoughts around how this, uh, sorry, the, the CRC is dealing with things like this? Yeah, well, as a philosopher, I'm a big fan of skepticism. Um, so I, I think um, automation bias, of course, is a lack of skepticism. So there's this huge issue in um, automated oil rigs um, in, you know, often the oceans where operators either trust the oil rig to do a good job so much that they don't pay attention, they're not very engaged in what's going on, and therefore they can't intervene in a timely fashion when the drill rig goes off and then they 
breaks a very expensive piece of equipment and the people who own the mining rig are very angry, the operator is supposed to shop it, stop it. Uh, and conversely, if you're overly skeptical and you're, you're constantly not trusting the systems and machines that if you've been given as an operator, it was very fatiguing and it's a bad use of human time. So in submarine design and many defense contexts, how to optimize human teams under increasing autonomy is just a huge area. So if you're interested in this sort of space, um, the journal Human Factors is a really good one that's open, you know, you can, you can read about it. Um, there's some recent team research, which is just fascinating, which shows that um, the best, probably the, one of the better relationships to have between humans and machines is not that there's one human operator managing, let's say five drones, which we've seen the cognitive workload of that type of arrangement is pretty awful for the human. They can only manage a few minutes of that and they get deeply fatigued. It's not a great model, but of course, defense and everybody else wants to figure out how do we scale? Like how do we have more of these autonomous systems and less humans and so forth? Um, but the army's probably got this right for thousands of years, which is that a group of about eight people, a section's worth, is a really good number of humans probably to be in a collaborative team uh, decision-making environment. So if you have a many-to-many -many model, you might be able to uh, maximise on the human cognitive potential to balance human biases with other... So every human is limited in what they can do and how they do it. Tim Miller, for example, can't uh, draw pictures and also listen at the same time. So in the team environment, you've got to get the right people in the team and the right autonomous systems in that team, the right algorithms that make sure that the right people are paying attention to the right component parts of the decision-making process. And if you physically collate humans together, they actually do this dance. So um, if you look at teaming environments where you've got everybody together, you can actually watch their physical body language. And if, if people are basically vibing, getting the vibe of the thing correct, they actually start to oscillate in similar ways to each other. Um, so we're getting much, much better to understand how to optimize groups of humans in order to take advantage of the good aspects of algorithms and to minimize a lot of the fatigue and the strange assumptions that people have made about how algorithms are gonna change work environments. So in the submarine case, for example, when they moved to the Collins class, Collins class submarines from the Oberon class, the Oberons were really manual and you had to physically move stuff around, which seemed like a lot of work. We're gonna reduce the work. We're gonna stop people doing stuff. Instead, we're gonna put them in front of these machines like this and they're gonna be able to make decisions. We're gonna automate a whole bunch of functions, which was good for certain types of submarine work, but they also tried to reduce the crew size. So the Oberons needed about 80 people and they reduced the Collins class submarine crews down to try and reduce the requirement. What happened? Well, the humans socially had a hard time. Humans really need other humans and they need a certain number of other humans to help out. And so there's a limit to, to, to the degree we, that we should be striving towards creating environments for humans that are bad for humans. And because when things are bad for humans, humans make bad decisions that are not the kind of decisions we want them to make. So how do we make environments in um, with computers and machines that are optimizing for the checks and balances that humans need, for the care that humans need as decision makers? We're not expecting our um, their service men and women to be managing you know, thousands of assets in ways that is um, unreasonable and would make them the moral crumple zone. And the moral crumple zone idea is this idea that um, when a human is in the loop, but they are expected to be able to control a machine in a way that's unreasonable. And with the Uber um, pedestrian fatality test case, it's a really good real world example where the algorithms of the Uber self-driving car were set at a threshold of risk where they couldn't detect and they didn't advise the human that that human, uh, that that pedestrian was walking across the road with their bicycle. There's lots of reasons why this is problematic, but in the court case, in the proceedings, the, um, the courts basically uh, assigned a greater moral responsibility to the human test driver who was on her phone, probably not a great thing. She was on her phone in that self-driving car test and she received um, penalty, whereas Uber suffered no penalty for the death of that pedestrian. So she suffered the moral crumple zone. That we need to be super careful about. Yes, I, I, I think this is, um, I like this uh, idea of the vibe. It's the vibe. You've just written my next grant proposal title for me. It's the vibe. Uh, yeah. um, Marbo. You need just Marbo. It's the vibe. I, I like this. Yeah, it can't be an overseas grant. It won't work. Um, okay, so um, I'm, the, the next question I want to address to Jeannie, and then I'll ask you later if she has anything to add as well. Um, it's 
I mean, where in in Australia, where are we in terms of best practice for legal frameworks in in regards to this area for organisations? Um, well, that's a big question. Um, now, I think I'm probably a legal optimist. I actually think we have quite good laws in place. I think the issue is working out how those laws apply. There's a tendency sometimes to resonate with some, some of the things the others have said is to think of AI as magic. So it doesn't, the, the law we have couldn't possibly apply to it. But AI at the moment is used as decision-making tools. And there are lots of laws that govern decision-making. Like, and those laws do apply to AI and they have often apply to the outputs of AI. So there is liability that attaches. The role, we come back to this point I made earlier about contestability. There's a big problem in Australia with access to justice. If I want to challenge a decision that's made about me by a government or a corporation, the thing that's gonna probably stand in my way is not the lack of a law, but my lack of finance to pursue that outcome. Now, there are things in Australia called ombudsmans. If I have a dispute with the bank, I can go to the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, which is an ombudsman, which takes on that complaint for me. Personally, I'd like to see more ombudsman services so that people who are affected by algorithms and also human decisions um, in industry have a, have, have a venue to take their complaint forward. And Henrietta, who um, is Tim Miller's PhD student, is writing a lot about this and made the point that, for example, in some of the worst out, um, outcomes that have been produced by um, very simple algorithms, the outcomes have risen because the people affected have nowhere to complain. Yes, that's right. Kate is smiling. Uh, Kate, did you want to add yes. something there? I can just see oh, you going. I'm just cheering, mate. I'm cheering. I think the justice issue cannot be overstated. The imbalance of power for the marginalised in our society is so extraordinary. The idea that laws with the current difficulty of actually financially accessing or making <laughs> what you're legally, um, what's available to you realised in our structures is, is so, so critical. And I would point out, you know, one of the um, a paper I've just submitted with my co-authors is around uh, the concept that we've got to get beyond ethics in the sense of um, uh, the ability to actually abide by ethics frameworks is something that the rich can afford, right? So if you look at Google, Google's just released um, ethical AI services. So all the big players, all the big corporations that are in control of AI are also powerful and rich enough to also build in their own ethical AI um, services. And communities, communities in our society don't have the resources to create their own AI, to collect their own data, to assist with their decision-making. So the augmented decision-making that is available to governments, corporations, and those with money and power is not available to the marginalised, the dispossessed. They don't have access to the ombudsman, but they also don't have access to their own platform. Like just think of, I don't know, a student who would be able to have access to all of their data in order to plead their case against a university, for example, or say someone in a health environment. I mean, recently my, um, my son got x-rays and scans. They gave the information to me on a CD. And I'm like, how do I not have access to all of my own health data? Like, why does the information go from the scanning radiology clinic to the doctor digitally and not to me at all, except for this CD, which I haven't had for 10 years? Like, we're really, really missing the mark on enabling people to have access to their own data. I agree. But, you know, that is, I mean, we have this thing in Australia called the open data right. Now, we may or may not argue about whether that's a good thing and how it's going to work, but the ambition behind the open data right is to allow consumers to take control of their own data, their financial data, their telecommunications data, their electricity consumption data. But, again, people have to, to come back to your point, people have to know it's there um, and be able to use it. So, yeah, I agree. Yeah, digital activism is a huge area. Data and digital activism is a huge area. It's a growth area. There's some good stuff on it. Um, you know, there's a book that I co-edited called Good Data. It's open access, of course, because it would be good to have data that's open. It's got chapters by 50 different co-authors around the world, every continent except Africa. I'm spruiking it because it talks about the open data index. It talks about how do you fight for your rights? And if you're in a citizen in a city that has a smart city, but your rulers are trying to use that smart city data to reduce your rights and freedoms. 
So how can you be a data activist in your society is a key part of trying to figure out how to maintain rights into the future. Mm, very interesting. Um, so I think then the, the, the last question, I'll, I'll actually probably, probably mostly um, Sulet and Jeannie, uh, but I'm sure some of you will have thoughts on this, but we are, I'm mindful of only about four minutes left. Um, and, and it comes on from Kate saying, I mean, what limits can we kind of enforce on this comes from the, the, the Q&A, what limits can we sort of enforce on providers in order to be able to trust them more, I guess? Are you happy for me to jump in there, Jeannie? Yes, please do that. <laughs> um, look, I guess the question is, can we enforce uh, rights on providers? You have the right to your own data, to control your own data, to access it, to see what data is collected, to see how it's used and whether it's repurposed. Our data is an extension of ourselves. We are our data today. It is our lives. It is talking to our friends online, our family, our financial transactions, where we take notes about the personal things in our lives, our photos. We live online. And the European Union has actually recognized this better than Australia with its laws in this space. So we don't need to reinvent laws. We could simply adopt those as a first port of call. Um, I think the fundamental question, though, is should we own that data? Do we have do we need to have an inherent right to our own data uh, and and also to defend others from having using or taking that data against our will? That's an easier thing for someone to understand than asking them, oh, well, if you analyze this algorithm, you'll be able to understand because it's been made transparent what it does. No, obviously you won't. I see this whole area as being a bit like gene testing 20 years ago. Great things came from that. Um, and there was a, a need, however, for some controls and a lot of public debate, like the discussion we're having here today. You don't want to stifle innovation because great things came from that. And you want to have both the economic growth that benefits us as well as the social good that can come from AI. You just need to do it, pardon the pun, intelligently. I think that's a very good note to, to finish on. Uh, the nice little bit of almost poetry at the end there um, summarizes things very well. So I might <clears throat> um, close off the, uh, the, the the questions now. And thanks very much uh, to, to all the panelists, uh, Kate, Susie, Jeannie, James, Vanessa and Anthony for their uh, input today. I thought it was, a, I had a great time. I thought it was a great discussion. I hope our nearly 300 participants um, did as well. Um, Zara's completed her illustration now, and you can see that on, on the spotlight then, and this will be distributed after the event, so you can have a look uh, in more detail. Thanks very much, Zara, for that uh, wonderful piece and for capturing me so flatteringly in the image there. Um, uh, and uh, th there will be a recording of the event uh, and this sent out uh, via email all next week uh, somehow. And so please don't hesitate to contact with uh, any of us after the event. And then, so just to, uh, final say, I'd like to thanks very, uh, thank very much Stacey Rusanova and Mel House who did all of the hard work for this event and then just let the seven of us take the, the glory uh, of being here on the event. So thanks very much for organising and thanks for Shanton for uh, setting up and, and you know, sort of recommending the, the people on the panel and for channeling all the questions. So thanks very much to everyone, to all the participants for coming. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day and stay in touch. <laughs>